Welcome to the first part of the 2023-24 Joint Contact and NMPCF Conference for Parent Carer Forums. I'm Carolyn Devaney, Head of Parent Carer Participation at Contact, and I'm joined by Tina Emery, Co-Chair of the National Network for Parent Carer Forums. This year's conference theme is Working Together, and as last year, we have a virtual conference um, this week with a series of workshops, which is followed by a face to face conference in February in Newcastle next year. That will also be live streamed and recorded for to enable more forums to attend. So we hope you're able to join us live for many of the sessions this week. But if you can't make it, most of the sessions will be recorded so that you can watch them later on and they'll be uploaded to Contacts Forum YouTube channel. Um, just to let you know, today's session is being recorded and everyone will be muted um, and have the cameras off throughout unless you're asking a question at the end to Alistair. Um, it just seems to be a pattern over the last few years that it's been an, another tough year um, for various reasons. But just after our conference in February, the Send and Alternative Provision Green Paper was published mm -hmm. and the new Send Area Inspections began. Um, delivering better value and safety valve of bringing in support and challenge to the 89 local areas with the highest def deficits to their designated mm -hmm. schools grants to enable them to create sustainable high needs systems and manage the need for good quality education, health and care plans and cost effective provision for children, young people with SEND. The Change Programme Partnership, which you'll hear about shortly from Alistair Duden from the DfE, is also getting started mm -hmm. and delivering reform is tough as we know, but without the legislative change to drive and underpin it, there's also some risk involved in that. So I'm going to hand over to Tina, who's going to tell you a little bit about the NMPCS involvement. Over to you, Good Tina. Mor Good morning, everybody. I'm Tina Emery. I'm one of the co-chairs of the National Network of Parent Care Forums. I think this, this week is uh, going to be really interesting. Um, we've got some really good sessions um, for you to join. Uh, and of course, we're still planning uh, our face-to-face -face conference, which is going to be in Newcastle in February. Um, we have got lots of um, sessions we can even now drop in today. So if you've got any questions about the NMPCF or the work that we are doing, please, it's not too late to join us at seven tonight. Uh, and you can see the, the conference programmes on our screen at the moment. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll show you how you can join us. Uh, it's not too late to book on any of those sessions. Um, which is which is obviously happening this week. Um, we do have a video from our minister, uh, David Johnson, OBE, Minister for Children's Families and Wellbeing. Uh, can you play the video, please, Helen? Hello, everybody. I am David Johnston, the Minister for Children, Families and Wellbeing. And I just want to say what a vital role I think parent carer forums play. I know myself as a constituency MP how important the voice of parents is for trying to make sure that children get the right support. I've had some great discussions with Tina and Sarah already and I want all of you to keep doing what you're doing, keep sharing the experiences of your children, passing them up to Tina and Sarah, letting the department know because you're going to be a key part of making sure that we reform the SEND and alternative provision system in the way that it needs to be reformed so that children can get the right support at the right time. Thank you, Minister. It is really, really important that um, we do feed this back. We will touch on that in our AGM, which is on tomorrow afternoon. Um, so please enjoy the conference, complete the evaluation. That's really important uh, after each session because it allows us to understand what you need from our next conference. Um, so I'd like to introduce Alistair Durden. Uh, who's going to talk to us about the Change Programme Partnership. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Tina. Uh, it's really good to be with you all today. Um, I am, my name's Alistair, as Tina said. I work on the uh, SEND reforms, the current package of SEND reforms in the Department for Education. And I'm also a veteran of the uh, previous SEND reforms. So, um, I was worked right through from 2010 through to 2014, um, developing the original green paper, then taking the legislation through Parliament. Um, and then I went and worked in Sheffield 
City Council for two and a half years on a secondment to help them implement those uh, 2014 reforms. And I can tell you that was the hardest part of the entire journey that I went on was those two and a half years. It's not easy to make a reality of some of the, the changes that we wanted to do. And, and Sheffield in particular really struggled with, with some of that. Um, so here I am again, a second attempt to try and make improvements to the SEND and AP system. So hopefully you can now see some slides that I put up on the screen. I've been uh, told in no uncertain terms that I need to tr try and not drop into departmental jargon, which I will, I will do my best uh, not to do. It's very easy for us uh, civil servants, these, the jargon and the acronyms trip off our tongues without too much um, thinking. So uh, do do say in the chat if you don't understand something I've said and, and others may answer or, or we can answer later on. We've got an hour and a half. We possibly don't need that full time. I'm going to go through what's quite a short slide deck, actually, although I'll unpack it probably in a little bit more detail than I might normally do and then take questions at the end and we can just open that up and have you know take as, as long as we need to try and get through a range of questions there's a couple of things that i want to just land up front as i start talking through what the the change program is all about firstly this this is about testing and iterating some of the big commitments in the send an ap improvement plan it's it's a genuine attempt to check that these things work before we make this a national system. And there's a number of people, as you'll see as I go through, that are requiring us to make sure that we produce the evidence out the back of the change programme before we make some of those decisions that might affect the whole system. Um, and that will become clearer as I go through the presentation. The second thing I, I just want to say up front, and again, you will hear me say this more than once, is that this is testing things at a system level. It's how might we shift and change the way the system operates to make support for children and young people with SEND or who are in AP much better than it is now. It is not focused at specific needs. So there isn't, for example, an element of this is directed at autism or an element of this that is directed at social, emotional, mental health needs. That said, if the system starts to work better, all of those specific needs should be met in a much better way than they are now. There is one exception to that, which is around speech and language, and I will touch on that um, when we get to that part of the presentation. So just to sort of give you that sort of context, that's what the change programme is at its very high level. And I'll take you through now just a little bit more detail about what it is and how it's operating and where it's operating. So for us, there's a real sense here that the whole system at the moment is out of balance. It's it's tilted right to the high cost end of the system. There's a real sense that too many of, of parents, the only way that you can get support is by fighting hard for an EHC plan and getting that EHC plan and getting those statutory protections. And then even then, it doesn't always deliver the support you need. And often it takes way too long to, to get to that point anyway. We want to try and rebalance the system so that actually those who need EHC plans, those with more complex needs, get them quickly and they get good quality ones and they get access to good provision. But actually many other children get support because they just need support and we provide it as a matter of course in the system. So that sense of can we get an early identification, an early intervention end of the system right that allows that seesaw you can see on the diagram to start coming back into balance so many more children just get the help when they need it without needing to necessarily go to an EHC plan and those who do need an EHC plan get the EHC plan and I think a simple example for me would be around a 15 year old with a reading age of seven who has dropped out of school got mental health issues potentially gets caught up in, in gangs and violence and all of the, the, the negative things that happen all because we didn't intervene and give them speech and language support when they were five years old. And that actually, if we'd done that, they would have been fine. And that's very different to somebody who's who's got more complex needs, more cognitive needs, all of those things where you do need that more statutory sort of end of the system. 
So how can we just bring that into balance? Because at the moment, the system is just fundamentally broken. And that means the good things from the 2014 reforms are not coming through in the way that the system is being delivered. So we have three real sort of big drivers for change here, which is about better experiences for families going through the system, wh wherever you are in the system, improve outcomes for our children and young people, which was always the intention of you know, the original reform support and aspiration was about how can we have high aspirations for our children and young people and help them achieve those outcomes. And that's very much where we're, we're still wanting to achieve that. But also, how do we do that in a financially sustainable system? There's ten and a half billion pounds already every year going into supporting children and young people. We send an AP. We're going to break that budget by one and a half billion by the end of this year. We don't think that all of that money is being used as well as and effectively as it could be. Um, and we, we need to change that and try and tilt that system. So the early identification and intervention and that improves support in and around the school system, um, early years as well, post 16, actually start to make the whole system work better for everybody involved, um, releasing capacity into the system because it's working in a much more effective way. So that's sort of the, the context, that's sort of the driver of the improvement plan and the change programme. When you come to the change programme specifically, what we're looking at is a model that is about testing and refining so like I said at the beginning, this is about taking some concepts that we've developed and we've developed those in consultation with PCF, with many, many other people from across the sector, different organisations representing different parts of the sector, local authorities, schools and others to develop some concepts and some ideas that we set out in the improvement plan. That we've refined a little bit further and now we're dropping those into the change programme to test those and to check if they work. And that testing very much needs to involve parents, children and young people, as well as all the different bits of the sector, like schools, like providers of particular specialist provision and so on. So really clear that this is genuinely about testing and refining. This is an opportunity in the areas where we're running this, and I'll come on to that more in, in due course, for parents and young people and children to be really involved in helping shape and refine what the reforms might look like um, before we go out into a national system. Every area is being asked to test as this, like I said, the system level reforms, but as a package, so across all of the local authorities involved, they will all be testing the same thing, broadly the same thing. And if you remember from the improvement plan, one of our drivers here is how do we have a system that delivers consistently across the country to a set of national standards that actually we raise the bar and we say everywhere should be delivering to that set of standards and we get rid of what some people would call the postcode lottery where depending on your where you live depends on how good or not the support is that you get and we need to change that and make this whole system work a lot better we have to ensure that reforms deliver those objectives that I've talked about before, but also, and this is really important to understand too, that it, we understand what it will take us to get the system from where it is now to where it can deliver to those nationally consistent standards. Some parts of the system, there are some local authorities and their partners out there that do this really well already, but they are probably the exception rather than the rule. And we need to, work out what's it going to take us to shift the whole system so that we get it to where it, we want it to be. And that is part of the deliberate design of the change program that I'll come to in a, in a very short moment. We also need to identify and address any unintended consequences. So there is some views from the 2014 reforms that because we didn't test like this, we didn't anticipate some of the, the, the consequences of designing the system in the way we did. There's lots of argument about that, lots of debate about what exactly what that looks like. But this time we really want to make sure that we understand if you do all of this stuff, does it work or does it create some other problems that we need to address first that we need to understand in the way we arrive at a final design of what the, the system might look like. So to test all of that, and those are very big objectives and we don't have a huge amount of time, 
um, so we've got until March 2025 as, as, a, as a minimum, possibly August 2025, to try and test some of this stuff out and see what happens. We decided to create nine geographical clusters of local authorities, so one in each of the Department for Education's regions. And in each of those clusters, there are between two and four local authorities who are working together to deliver this package of changes to the send and ap system that we want to test out they are grouped around a lead local authority now that lead local authority was selected using um, some data that gave us an indication that they were doing all right so good data on there you know where they're at with their ehc plan 20 week target um, low rates or lower than average rates of exclusions for send an ap children lower than average rates of requests for education health and care plans on the basis that that was indicating they were doing something much better at the front end of the system and the final category was about where they were at in their funding you know how much pressure were they under under funding that gave us a list of about 20 local authorities that we invited to express an interest and that that's how we arrived at the nine lead local authorities and then the other local authorities in the patch are literally picked because they are geographical neighbours of that lead local authority. There was no other rationale for that other than they couldn't be on the safety valve programme, which you may know about. I won't go into that now. Uh, happy to take questions on that if you don't know what the safety valve programme is when we get to the end. That means while we've got a lead LA that we think is probably doing a good, good job and is, is leading the way a little bit with some of this, the other local authorities are literally the good, the bad and the ugly. We could have some really bad local authorities in there who've just failed their Ofsted drastically um, and actually are really struggling to make this work alongside some local authorities that might be okay on some things, but not so good on the others. And that's really, really deliberate because that takes us back to, we need to understand what does it take to get the worst to where the best are and what's it take to get the best to where we want the whole system to be. So that's a real deliberate, design intention there and we've we're really bringing in the integrated care board so that bit of the health system used to be called clinical commissioning groups i think we're now talking about integrated care boards they are very much part of this to try and really understand what does it take to engage the health system which i know is a big concern for many people in the whole way we support children and young people with special educational needs that partnership at that sort of grouped level also needs to include schools, early years, post 16 and anybody else um, in the in that sort of local system that is about delivering the system as well as representative of parent carers and children and young people. So there's a whole strategic grouping of individuals that need to come together to design what this looks like at that cross local authority level um, as well as individual local authority level, which I'll come on to shortly. They're getting about six and a half million per, per change programme partnership over the course of the programme. We're also supporting them with a delivery partner who I'll talk about a little bit more in, in due course. So that's an external consortium of experts who've come together to help us support those areas. And a lot of support from my unit, my team here in the department who will be out and about in those local areas, making sure they're doing what we need them to do. Part of what this involves is learning as we go so there's a real-time feedback loop which is about almost weekly we're going how's this going how difficult is it who's not joining in which partners don't want to play the game which schools don't want to play the game how easy is this for parents are are we actually beginning to shift and change things in those areas in a way that parents can really re you know resonate with that and they um, they can see it and they can see and feel the difference already so um, that's that's very much about that collaborative approach to how we deliver the change programme. So that's the change programme structure. Where are they all? Um, that's on the next slide. And I can see, I think there's a comment in the chat there. So you can see that map. And I think these slides are going to be available if they haven't been um, made available already. So you can, um, you can see where they all are. Um, there's a group of them in each of, of DFE's regions, like I said, and a real mixed bag of, of local authorities in terms of cap capacity, capability and quality of, of current delivery. In two of the areas, so in East Midlands 
and in southwest there isn't a lead local authority um, the selected lead local authorities in those areas didn't want to do it um, so we ended up with a slightly different model which is basically a partnership model so the three uh, East Midlands local authorities are sharing that leadership role and working together collectively as they are as the two local authorities in southwest are as well so Swindon and Gloucestershire down there so that's the only slight difference to the model I described earlier but you can see where all the other local authorities are there and we've tried as far as possible to get quite a mix of demographics so some rural areas some big urban areas etc so we can test across different types of local authorities because we understand you know what works in London may not work everywhere else for example so hopefully that gives you a feel for where we're testing and whether or not any of you are in those areas and if you are hopefully you will be able to get involved in the program as it develops which takes me on to the question of what is it testing so there are a bunch of reforms in the improvement plan some of which we're just doing outside of this program so things like supported internships and expanding that things like trying to increase the capacity and the numbers of education psychologists all of those things are going on anyway and they're outside of this program but there are some very specific system level things that we are testing within this program itself these are none of these things require us to change the legislation with the exception of a couple of points on EHC plans which I'll touch on to for them to happen now these are all things generally speaking that could be happening now and in some good areas some of these things already are happening now where we would need to change legislation or possibly funding in the future is to make them happen everywhere um, so no parent in the change program areas who's involved in helping us test this is going to have to somehow give up their statutory rights i just want to really make sure that's really clear nobody's having to give up any statutory rights we might ask some people some parents to help us test some things that they volunteer to say i want to test this even though it's not 100 percent in line with the current um statutory and, and code of practice regulations but that's that's an option it's it's a you know it's an opt-in option rather than a you must do this and somehow um, forego some statutory rights and I'll talk that's mainly in the EHC plan space and I'll talk about that when I get to that bit of this slide we've blocked these sort of reforms into three sort of broad areas so what we're calling um because we like to give things labels in in the civil service we're calling these enablers so these are the things on the left hand side of this slide that are about how does the system get set up at a local level to help us deliver this well so that includes things like pulling together what the improvement plan described as a send and ap partnership so that's health that's the local authority that's parent groups that's voice of young people and children that's your education settings early years secondary primary it's your specialist settings how do they come together in a partnership in a formal partnership to help design and run the local system and that partnership has to produce what says here is, is called a LAPE, a local area inclusion plan. So they need to set out in a published plan how they are going to deliver the system and how they're going to do it in a way that improves on um, how, it's, how it's run at the moment um, or takes the best in the best areas or takes the best and really sets out how that's going to work. We need that to be supported by really good data so we're providing a, a high level dashboard at this point in time it's got a range of data that's available pulled into one place to help local areas start to think about what actually are the numbers telling us and therefore how does that help us work out where to focus our efforts and our energies and our funding um, for the best effect for those children and young people in our area um, and that dashboard will be publicly available as well so the part of the idea behind that is eventually it becomes something that everybody has access to and you can compare and contrast between different local authorities if you wish to do so um, there's been a lot of development behind that I think I don't think it's quite where it needs to be yet but that's the idea behind the dashboard and all of those areas at the moment are in a setup phase so we have started we launched the program back in September and those areas are now working on all of those bits at the moment they're pulling together a an overarching plan across all of the local authorities involved but they're also all as individual local areas beginning to work on pulling together that send an ap partnership and putting in place that inclusion plan so again 
as parents in, in those areas, if you're in those areas, you should be hearing about this if you haven't already very, very shortly. Um, and the groups that represent you or groups that you're part of that are representative should be asked to be involved in that. And we have made it very clear that PCF groups in particular should be sat on those partnership groups. Um, so that's the, the key way in. Then one of the things that we've asked them to do, and this is where I think going back to some of the points I've made before, where we think the whole of this sort of hangs around, can we get that early identification and intervention right, sits in this middle block that we, we call in the improvement plan, and we've got to think of a better title for this, ordinary available provision. And there's some very specific things in this space that we want to test, but this is probably also the area where we're going to allow areas to have a lot of flexibility to do some innovation and some creative work, particularly with um, specialist providers and linking them in with mainstream education settings. So some of the things we're, we're doing here that we set out in the improvement plan, the three tier AP service. Some of you may not know too much about this, but in effect, we want AP uh, alternative provision. Um, to become a place that is is about an intervention, not a destination. So we don't think that children who, for whatever reason, the school can't cope with, should just find themselves an alternative provision, and that's where they finish their school school career. That's not what we think alternative provisions for. <clears throat> it is about providing interventions and support that help get those children and young people back on track and reintegrate them back into mainstream education, or for those who really genuinely need it, enabling them to make that transition across into specialist settings. Part of that three tier service involves taking the best of our alternative provision providers and getting them to work in a mainstream setting as part of an early intervention package. So actually, as, as a child, <coughs> excuse me, begins to display some unusual behaviours that, that uh, for them is not normal, um, actually, let's get some help in now rather than waiting and leaving and ignoring those behaviours until they get to a point where actually we think we're starting to have, you know, the word exclusion is being mentioned in the conversation. This is not about an intervention that happens just before we exclude somebody. This is about an intervention that happens much further upstream from that. And, and if it works, stops us ever getting to the point of having to talk about exclusion in the conversation. So that's the three tier AP service. The other two tiers are about lifting them out of a school setting for a short period of time, say six weeks, doing some intervention elsewhere and then putting them back in um, with some support. The third tier would be about actually that school's not the right place for them. We need to lift them out, do some interventions and then find a different place for them to be, whether that's reintegrating back into mainstream somewhere else or whether that's into special school. Alongside that, we have also got our um, what's called on here LSEC, so it's the early language support for every child. Now, this is the one thing where we're doing a, a specific condition based um, bit of testing all around speech and language need and speech, language and communication needs. This is jointly funded with NHS England, which is another way of bringing the integrated care board at a local level to the table because the integrated care board have half the money for this bit of the programme and local authorities have half the money for this bit of the program. So if they want to deliver this, they have to talk to each other and they have to be sat around the table. And, and that's deliberate about us trying to bring some levers to get health to come and sit around the table in, in this program. This is all around how can we identify speech and language needs really, really quickly in early years and primary settings and get that professional support in at that point because that's how we discover actually this is just a need that if we address it now, we'll get that child back on track and they'll be absolutely fine for the rest of their life. Or actually this is a need that is demonstrating there's something more complex going on and we need to actually bring in a whole range of other bits and pieces of support. And we need to do it now, not wait until they're 15 before we do it. So that's going to be really interesting to see how much impact what are going to be community based teams of speech and language professionals working in and around the school system in early years and primary and intervening really early, what sort of impact that can have. And then alongside that, we're talking about, we have some alternative provision specialist task forces. Some of you may know about those because they exist anyway, but we're encouraging these change program areas if they haven't got them to just look at the model and see how they can set up that model themselves. And we're also saying, and anything else, 
that you think is good practice that is all about how do you build team in and around the school of multidisciplinary professionals that actually can do that one-off specialist intervention that actually helps just get a child back on track or identifies that there is something more needed so that we can make this system work a lot more effectively and a lot better and we can genuinely make sure we are helping people at the earliest possible opportunity whether that is a one-off specialist intervention whether that's a bit of a change to classroom practice or whether that's because we're identifying complex needs and we need to put an EHC plan in place quickly that I think more than anything else is the bit of the system and the change that we've got in mind that we think could actually shift the system quite dramatically in the way we want it to go but we can talk about that a bit more later and then the last bit on this side is is really around the EHC plan process now I'm really clear that if we just change the EHC plan process EHC plan process we're not going to fix the problems in the system we can make this look as great and wonderful as we like but if we still cannot cope with the capacity of requests coming in because the front end of the system isn't working well then this still isn't going to fix everything but if we get the other bits I've talked about right this stuff starts to come into its own so this is about how do we have much better, more collaborative, more co-produced multi-agency panels where there's a much better conversation between parents and, and professionals around what is needed, what, what, how are we identifying needs, when we've identified those needs, what are we doing about them and, and getting that EHC plan up and running really quickly. It's about having a standardised EHC plan format. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether that's needed or not. I think it depends on your experience and where you are in the system. But some of that is about thinking ahead to do we move it all onto a digital platform, which some local authorities have already done. Many others haven't. So this is sort of a precursor to testing. If we went to a digital approach, would we need a standard format? And does the standard format we've given these local areas to test, does it does it work? Is it the right sort of thing? How different is, is it from what you're used to and is it better or worse strength and mediation so again really ramping up the role of mediation here hopefully because we don't need it as much because the rest of the system starts to work a bit better but when we do need it it works really well and then the bit that i think most people think are quite uh, cont controversial is the what the improvement plan describes as tailored list so when you get to the end of an ehc plan process that parents are given a list of institutions that the local authority thinks will help meet their child's needs um, and get the outcomes that we're after. This is only controversial if you see this as a trying to restrict choice. If you see it as a logical conclusion of a process that works much better where you've been talking about which school or which provider all the way through that journey so you know as a parent by the time you get to the end of that journey these schools are the ones that can really help my son or daughter and those schools are then all included on that list so there are no surprises that that's really effective that's much better if it just becomes about restricting choice then i agree with you it becomes a very different thing altogether so in a nutshell, that's what we're testing through the, the change programme. There's a lot in there. I appreciate that. And I'm more than happy to, to take some time to unpack some of those things if that's helpful later. All of that will feed into um, the development of national standards and, and how we go about buying our services in a local area. So there's some big questions around that that this change programme is going to help us answer, and potentially help us test towards the end of the, the programme as well. Um, this is just a trying as a graphic as a visual to try and explain what it looks like as, as a system hanging together so you've got your enablers on that left hand side your partnership your plan your data feeding into this middle block around what can we do to get early identification intervention right make sure we're getting that support in at the earliest possible opportunity supported by an ehc plan process that works much better than the current one I'm feeding into those national development of national standards and commissioning. I'm not going to dwell too much on this. It's, it's literally just to try and uh, give you a more simplified view of how we think the system hangs together. But every area in the change programme should be testing that, what you can see on that screen there. Um, and you should be very aware of that if you are in those areas and invited to be part of helping to test that. Just a couple of other things to say, <clears throat> and then we can open it up for discussion. This is our delivery partner. So Reaching Excellence and Ambition for All Children is the title they've given themselves. And they are a consortium of organisations that came together and bid through an open competition 
um, for the privilege of working with us and helping support the department to shape the reform and deliver the reform program, the change program for SEND and AP. So you have in there PA Consulting, who bring that real expertise in system transformation, in program management, all the sort of things you need when you're delivering a program of this sort of scale and complexity. The Council for Disabled Children are part of that, so they bring a lot of that expertise in understanding the needs of children and young people with special educational needs. Empower also have been in and around the system, work a lot with local authorities on, on various improvement programmes um, across children and young people's space. And then we have Olive Academies Trust. Um, and for those who don't know Olive Academies Trust, they're based in and around sort of the Thurrock area of the country. And they are exceptionally good at delivering alternative provision support. And their chief executive also heads up the, um, the, the national CEO network, chief executive officer network for special, special schools and AP schools um, who are um, academized so that they've got a whole range of people that they can bring in to help support and really help us improve how the alternative provision bit of the system works um, in the change program. So real range of expertise in there again working very closely with those local authorities involved in the program very much visible and physically present with those local authorities on a very regular basis as are my team. So that's our delivery partner. And then just um, just a final sort of reflection on our launch event that we held in September, um, which Tina and others came to. Um, and Tina was part of uh, the Q&A session towards the end of the day. It was one of the best attended events I've uh, been privileged to, to run. Um, and we didn't get that normal. It's three o'clock, everybody goes home to catch their train. Um, even though it was in London, everybody stayed right till the end. There was a real desire to work together and to make this work. Um, and you, we basically had nine tables with each of the, the change programme partnerships around those nine tables. Um, we heard from the minister again, as you've done this morning, Dame Christine Lenehan spoke, um, our permanent secretary came, which is a real sign of how seriously the department's taking this. And she spoke to, um, and obviously the National Parent Care Forum and others were there as were NHS England. It was a really positive day, real energy and room, real determination from those local areas to come together and, and try and make this system much better than it is now. So um, good start, a good start. Um, and we'll see if we can really follow through on that energy and really drive the change we need to see. And that is it from me. Um, in terms of my input, I am more than happy. That's been a lot of stuff. I've covered a lot of ground. I've gone into possibly a bit more detail than I might otherwise have done, but I'm more than happy to to now open up and just take questions and, and discuss um, some of this stuff. Tina, back to you. Thank you. Um, I've taken my uh, headset off because there was complaints uh, in the chat that I was quiet, but I have got a cold, so bear, bear with me. You best sound um, better now. Do I? OK, yeah. thank you. Um, uh, so we do have a couple of questions in the chat, uh, mainly, I think, on the focus of um, specialist support or, or um, SEN support um, and obviously the EHCPs. And you touched on it in your presentation, mm -hmm. but I think the questions raised and, and it was Zara in the chat is, it, you know, with the focus of SEN support and EHCPs, how, you know, what does the DFE want to get out of that? What is the end outcome for those children that don't have a plan and also those children that have a plan? Um, yeah. how, do, how do we how do we make sure it's it's clear and those children get the support that they need? Absolutely. And I think mm -hmm. that's a, that's a really good question. And we need to do it in a way that doesn't just generate a whole bunch more conflict in the system. There's enough conflict in this system. And I do feel some of that conflict is driven by local authorities and schools that basically ask parents to have, the, you know, to sort it out themselves. You know, they can't agree on how they're going to help a child or young person. So they just go, we'll leave it up to the parents to take the tribunal. Nobody's ever going to actually say that in those terms, but that's what it feels like that actually parents become, you've, you know, the proxy for people that can't agree. So there's a whole conversation around how do we create a system that is accountable for delivering to a set of standards that would drive exactly that support. So everybody knows what's expected in that front end of the system that if, you know, if somebody's got 
is falling behind in their speech language and communications that actually we help them straight away. We don't wait for years and years and years until it becomes a massively complex issue. Um, and that's because we've got some national standards that set out what that looks like. And actually one of the reasons we're specifically focusing on that in the change programme is because one of the first standards that I think we're working on will be around speech language and communication needs. So there, there, those two things in tandem, it's about how do we create a system that's accountable? So how do we make local authorities and their partners accountable to each other and able to hold each, hold each other to account? So that's schools, local authorities and health working together. And then how might the department, if you like, be the enforcer of that accountability? So actually we, we hold the system to account for delivering as well. There's a huge amount of legislation out there already. The 2014 Act is pretty comprehensive. I think you could probably count on the fingers of one hand how many times anybody's actually held local partners to account for delivering against those statutory duties. Um, other than Ofsted coming and telling people they're not doing it very well, that's about it. And I think that's one of the missing bits of the jigsaw is holding the system to account. And that comes massively important if we're saying we want that front end of the system to work better. We want, if you like, what was the local, what is the local offer in the current system to become it more than it currently is? How do we make sure that actually happens without just creating a you know a new set of you know need to go to the tribunal because they're not delivering this end? Never mind, they're not delivering the EHC plan end. Um, and that's really important, and that's part of what the change program needs to help us learn and understand is exactly what are the levers we need to put in place there, what might those national standards look like, and how we might we make the system work as we want it to um, in future, whether that's through legislation and or through um, uh, funding incentives, because if you attach people's funding to whether they deliver this stuff, that does does tend to focus their attention a little bit more um, than it might otherwise do. Um, thank you. And forums do try and hold local authorities or local areas to account for, for not following the law. Um, there is a question in the chat that I'm going to go to first before we go to the hands. Um, we've got th we've got three hands up currently. So Lizzie's put in the chat, our LA is in the safety valve programme, meaning that four of our boroughs in the same ICB as us are in the change programme cluster, but we're not. How will this affect us when we are trying to do joint approaches, example, autism assessment, ADHD assessment in our ICB area? Um, it shouldn't affect you any in any adverse way at all. Um, the challenge with the safety valve programme was that local authorities in that space are in really dire straits financially and we didn't want to um, detract from them recovering that position by asking them to be involved in the change programme as, as well. So that's that's the rationale behind that. And but that shouldn't stop local authorities working together um, in their, their clusters. Yes, you might have part of your cluster that is in the change programme partnership. But one of the things that should benefit you from is that learning should find its way out very quickly to those other local authorities in the area. And one of the things we've asked the, change, the delivery partner to do, um, particularly as we get into next year and we start to learn stuff and learn what's working, is really start to help us push the best practice we're learning out into those wider spaces um, to say, this is going to help you with, for example, putting those strategies together or those joint approaches to autism assessment together. Um, because this is what we've been learning in the change programme partnership. So it shouldn't be a barrier um, and we should keep be very alive to that because if it starts to become one, we need to address that quite quickly. OK, we've got some hands up and we've also got somebody else that's put in the chats, but we'll go to the hands up first. Um, and I've disabled the um, the the so they can actually talk and switch their camera on. Um, so Holly, Great. did you? <laughs> so we can actually see them. Uh, Holly, do you want to come in with your question? Because you were first. Thank hi, you. Holly. Um, hi, yeah. yeah. I think my main question really is around um, the, the programme as a whole. And I think the um, the involvement of the rest of the Department for Education. So you've obviously got the part that's working on this and that kind of branch. Um, but I think at the moment, the, the thing that I see as a barrier to any of this working um, is things like you know the pressures on schools the funding mm. pressures the workforce pressures the all of the bureaucracy that comes with um you know the, the non-teaching part of the things that teachers have to do yeah. that even with the best of intentions um just mean that actually doing that early intervention is really really difficult or nigh on impossible um and i think you know and you kind of hit the nail on the head when you said about actually a lot of this all of the the 
the legal requirements for a lot of this is already there mm. um and it's a case of how do we a hold people to account and i think when we talk about accountability often what we as parents mean is also consequences i think sometimes they're used a bit synonymously um but also making sure that schools and local authorities are in a position where they can do those things um at the moment i just think you know from talking to schools that kind of go we want to do all this early intervention and we just can't yeah yeah i totally totally agree with all of that and you know you don't have to read very far in in this the press to do with the schools that we struggle to even recruit teachers at the moment never mind get teachers that can do all this stuff that we're asking them to do so that there is a big challenge in the school system and in the education system more broadly um, i think and that's recognized and part of what the change program can help us understand is is what are those challenges really evidence how difficult it is to do some of this stuff so again part of what I said at the beginning about the change programme helping us learn what it's going to take to shift the system to where we need it to be could be telling us it's not going to work because this this and this gap in the system which we all probably intuitively know but it starts to give us that real concrete evidence that we can go back and make some arguments to Treasury for example about we're going to need this to really change the system so that's part of the answer I think the other thing and Tina's heard me say this before is I think we are we find ourselves in an interesting moment where for the first time and I've been doing this for over 30 years for the first time I can remember the children's services side of the department and the school side of the department seem to be talking the same language um, so there are conversations about what does an inclusive system look like that I've not heard us have like this in the department before now so I think we have a, a moment of opportunity Often with these moments of opportunity, you never quite know how long they're going to last. Um, yesterday's interesting changes actually worked in our favour. I won't comment more on that, but, you know, I think that, you know, some of the, the changes there will help us um, uh, in that regard as well. And we are talking to, for example, the Confederation of School Trusts. So that's the big organisation that is the professional organisation that represents all the academies out there they are talking this language as well they're really talking the language of belonging of being part of the community that it's that they uh, this, we went to their national conference of the week and they had two sessions on on send an ap really sort of trying to unpack this and work out how do we do this so i think everybody is is beginning to have the same conversation but there's some really challenging issues out there like you said so you know how do we get the teachers in in the first place how do we equip teachers to understand what classroom practice looks like for children with send how do we make sure there's a TA workforce that's equally equipped? How do we make sure that outside the school, you've got that team around the school model so that access quick and swift access to specialist interventions um, that might actually mean, you know, like I said before, we intervene now, we, we stop this becoming a complex need um, because we intervene early. All of that stuff is really, really challenging and we recognise that and that's why the change programme needs to help us understand the scale of that challenge and what we might need to put into the system to to actually tackle it. It's difficult, it's very difficult. It's a good question, Holly. Thanks, Holly. And um, we do have a, another, um, before we go to um, Jane, there is a, a comment in the question and answer um, chat and she's and, and it's Claire Richmond how do we measure success for children and young people who do not have an EHCP via an EHCP we measure against outcomes what success criteria do we need for all children and young people with SEND um, not just academic attainment and attendance yeah. please yeah yeah um, I think the answer to that is I agree with you um, and and yes and I think you know what's interesting is in the conversation that's happening across the department and the sector at the moment there is that includes a conversation about how do we measure outcomes and success for children and young people um, even to the extent that you know that what does that look like in terms of the current school performance framework and does that need to be shifted and changed um, yeah, i suspect there are some very strong answers on that might come through um, but you know that is part of the conversation so what does success look like how are we going to measure that and how do we do that for kids that don't quite have the same formal um, designation of SEN as those with an EHC plan do that we can track more easily in the system and understand what those outcomes look like. So absolutely, it's a really good question. The change programme needs to help us begin to answer some of those questions. 
Thank you. Jane, do you want to come on in? You should be able to uh, switch your camera on and un unmute yourself. Morning, Jane. You're right. Morning. I'm fine. Thank you. I'm working from home. I've got to, I've got to do this cold, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I share. I share my love. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Jane. Oh, you, you muted you've yourself got, again, you've Jane. You've gone back on mute for some reason. Oh, God. Sorry. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Working off the sofa, isn't it? So, um, <coughs> so we're on the change programme leads in Telford in, in Telford and Reakin. So we've had some initial um initial conversations, but not a much, not a very detailed conversation yet. But my questions are around the alternative um provision offers. So are we looking at are we looking at sort of like five from school from the whole school age from five to up to 25 um and then the other bit as part of that is when it when it does it become social care alternative for social care led or education led and looking at those and looking at those outcomes because even with the hcps it's you know you get to that social care question and it's sort of like well what school doing about social care about friendships about relationships about the and then the education going oh that's not all you need you know you need a short break to access that yeah, but yeah. short breaks we've got you know short breaks we know that criteria is changing it's getting much it's getting much tighter it's much more focusing on um specialist and tar you know specialist and sort of targeted needs you know i think that's happening across it's not just happening here where we are it's happening and for me i'd like to understand where the social care element comes into this um this piece of work, this this change program as well. Alongside that as well, um, Alistair is around sustainability of special school places. We, I spoke to a school, yes, school rang me yesterday to ask me for advice yesterday. Um, they'd got a five-year-old little boy and he was working at 10 months, he was working at 10 months old and he was in a mainstream, he was in a mainstream school. Now, Norm, you know, a few years ago, he would probably would have been in a specialist setting, wouldn't he? You know, and school were going, we're doing the best, we're doing the best absolutely we can you know so um and also around uh, the third point my final point is around the funding going in for this work is is that is that being is that being ring fenced for the time of the project cool um thank you good questions good questions i'm going to take them in reverse order funding yes it's it's effectively ring i mean they okay the technical thing is the local authority has it on a section 31 grant which technically means they could go and use it to fill holes in the roads if they genuinely wanted to do that but obviously we are working very closely with them they have to submit plans telling us how they're going to spend the funding the funding will come out in blocks so if they're if we have any concerns that they're not spending the funding on what we want them to do we don't have to you know we're not obliged to issue them the next block of funding so <laughs> technically it isn't ring fence but to all intents and purposes it is because we're very clear what we want them to do with with that funding um so that's the easier answer. Special school places is it's an interesting one because uh, I'll I'll take it from an anecdotal point of view from when I worked in in Sheffield Council, and the special school heads there said to me on a fairly regular basis, a third of the children we have don't need to be here; they should be in mainstream. And that is part of where the pressure is coming from on special schools. I think we've got. You know, the, the strap line of the improvement plan was the right support at the right time in the right place. I think yeah. in too many bits of the system, we've got the wrong support in the wrong place. It might be at the right time, but it's not necessarily the right support or the, or in the right place. And actually, that's part of what I might mean by rebalancing the system, because then if you get that right, you start to free up that capacity in special school to do what special school was always designed to do, which was help those with the more complex needs. Um, and at the moment, one of the implications of special schools not being able to do that is those with more complex needs get shunted out into the independent end of the sector where we have far less levers checks and balances and levers to make sure that what's going on out there is is really beneficial to those children and young people so that's partly what i mean by that rebalancing of the system and, and making sure each part of the system is is fulfilling the role it was meant to fulfill um, which it's not at the moment, I think. And so for me, that sustainability of special school places all hangs on. Can we rebalance the system? And where we need to, as we've you know just announced recently, you know where there is a need for some more special school places, that we do that through the free school system and we build some more schools. But obviously they take years to come online. So yeah. the, the ones we announced the other week, you know, it's going to be two years before they open their doors as a minimum, if, if not longer. And then your final point is about the social care Again, this is always a, an interesting one because the local authority are, 
are leading this and social care and a sort of special needs bit of the system are both theirs. So we need to work out how the local authority holds itself internally accountable and we hold the local authority accountable for delivering the social care elements of this because that's, you know, already with an EHC plan, they should be doing that. But again, you know, I remember, you know, my time working in, in the council that, that care would quite often because they were strapped for cash because austerity went up to, you know, got dialed up to 11 in the middle of trying to implement the 2014 reforms. Um, they would often try and push that onto the education side because that was the one place where a bit of the money was was ring fenced. And so I think there's a real, there is a real challenge there of how we make sure that social care are very much integrated in part of this and are part of that partnership, send an AP partnership that we're asking every local area to put together and they're part of informing what that inclusion plan looks like and what it says about the social care elements of support that we need to put in place. Thank you. That's probably raised more questions, more, more questions, yeah. to be honest, Alistair. These things then, often uh, do, but yeah. Let me go away and have a reflect on that. So thank That's you. Fine. And if there's any any questions that come to you after the session, Jane, and this applies to anybody, please do email in to us at the, at the NMPCF because we can pass these messages on to, to Alistair. We do have regular conversations <laughs> and we have been quite, you know, we've been challenging to the to the programme already about certain things around comms and, and such like. So we do have lots of conversations quite regularly with Alistair. Um, before we go back to, um, thank you, Jane. Before we go to Zara, there is a question in in the chat let me just find mm -hmm. it it's from emma with respect to independent ap all of the las have been left to create their own databases of ap's that have passed their due diligence and safeguarding checks the schools follow ofsted's guidance but are not very confident with this and cannot use the las databases if they are ne uh, the named school what this means is each la is reinventing the wheel uh, each school is using their time and funding for checks and each AP is having to devote, devote hours of work to submit bids to work with them. Each school and LA is asking for different something different. Why wasn't something created centrally for the LAs to use so there is harmony and cost would have been greatly reduced? Oh, That's quite that a good a, question. That's a big question. It's a big um, question. It's a good question. I and I'm don't... slightly putting you on the spot. No, that's fine. I I don't quite recognise all LAs have been left to create their own databases because I think that might be a local thing because I don't think all, we're not requiring all LAs to do that. So that's a local decision that's been made. Um, and so you're getting caught up in a, in a local solution that has been put in place in the absence of a centrally directed solution. So, I, I, you know, I think that's part of what's going on there. I might be wrong about that, but I don't want to comment too more on, on the, the specifics there because I'm um, I'm not as close to the AP stuff as I used to be. However, we did do quite a big piece of work and a call for evidence around how does the independent AP sector work? Who's including in that? Does it cover everybody from your, you know, your local car mechanic down the road who offers a, a, an AP school a couple of hours a week for little Johnny to come and do a bit of car mechanics or little Susan to come and bit, do a bit of car mechanics right through to those much bigger, more um, um, APs that are actually, you know, they've got more than, you know, they take a lot of kids. They're not just in a one-off couple of hours a week for a particular individual. They're, you know, they're much more in integrated in the system. And there's a, there's real concern from Ofsted around how we make sure, particularly, you know, not just the issues you've raised there around the amount of work that goes into doing this right, but actually how we have a system that is safe for all the children and young people, particularly given the vulnerabilities of the kids we're talking about. Um, are safe in those settings and that we're all we know the right people are holding the right bits of the system to account and that's part of it's outside of the change program it's part of what um, one of my colleagues is working on is is how do we create that system that works well with independent sector and doesn't have all of these different ways of doing it that is bringing up in local areas in the absence of any central direction it's a real challenge here between how do you create a system that text and is streamlined without creating a system that is just unmanageable. There used to be a central database of all independent AP, but it went out of date every 24 hours. And so it became too labor intensive to keep it up because you were including all those tiny, tiny little providers that do the one off bit of help here, the one off bit of help there, as well as those big, more established providers. So 
Um, there's a there's a lot of work going on around that. It's outside of the change program. Um, so I think all I can say at this stage is, is watch this space in terms of how the department responds to that call for evidence around independent AP. Thank you. She has put in the chat where she's working. Um, so she works in Hampshire, Surrey and Wokenham. So but it's good to have that conversation. Um, Zara, would you like to come on screen? Lovely to see you this morning. Morning. Um, yeah, so kind of an extension of some of the questions that have already been asked. Um, I'm really mindful that this sounds like a really good opportunity for growth and development on the learning that each local area has done since the reforms were implemented. One of the challenges that we're facing in our area is that as a system, <clears throat> as a system, we feel that we've actually progressed beyond where some of the change programme is working towards. And actually some of the change programme feels like a step backwards for our area with regards to the digitalisation of the HCP tool, for example, the content, the mechanism, um, but also actually the practicalities of the way that we're working, like the fact that forums aren't necessarily involved in the conversations directly unless it's at the local level. Um, those kind of things feel like a little bit of a step backwards. So I suppose the progression from the questions that have already been asked is how can we ensure that things like specialist support that currently EHCPs are potentially inaccurately utilised to garner for accessing some of those more universal services, as, as Tina articulated in my question before, around making sure that there isn't that gap between mm -hmm. Send Support and EHCP inadvertently created by, by this kind of chasm of a mechanism. Um, that doesn't currently exist. But also, as the other questions have alluded to, how do we then address the funding gap that needs to be resolved and the geographical disparity of provision availability across different areas yep. and the, the funding capacity of different schools based on, you know, population base and geography and what trust they're part of sometimes can make a huge difference to what funding they have available to them. How are we going to make sure that all of that is taken genuinely into consideration and redressed? And I appreciate you've said that some of this might result in recommendations for legislative change, which may be a big mechanism to enable some of that. But in the short term, my concern is that some of the change program may put practice in place that doesn't require legislative change, that effectively strangleholds areas to an extent in doing things in a way that is not beneficial to their community because yeah. they may already have found some solutions that the change in AP programme won't necessarily be driving at a national level. Cool. Um, the 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 dodge the question answer is that's what the change program is designed to tell us <laughs> is the answers to all of those questions um I, i'm not just going to dodge the question that would be unfair and i, I, yes, I appreciate your, your, that <laughs> your, your 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 screen backdrop that you're um based in shropshire so obviously telford and yep. Reakin are very much part of the change program and they are one yep. we think they're one of the better leading lights out there in terms of getting this right uh, there are a number of other areas you, you you can disagree with that if you like but that's what we think um we um in those sort of spaces, part of that, there's been a big conversation about does national standards create a race to the bottom? You know, mm -hmm. do we do we actually lower the bar so that actually those areas that are doing this really good stuff go, oh, we don't have to do that anymore. We we come down to this lower bar. That's not what we want to achieve. So we want those national standards to drive high quality, not drive a race to the bottom. So in places like Telford and Reakin, in places like Barnet in London, which is another area that we think is doing really good stuff. Um, actually, what we're change program is doing there is learning from that good stuff and going actually let's refine the policy in the direction of that good stuff rather than saying let's bring it down a level because everybody else couldn't get there so there's very much an intention of going trying to work out I mean there has to be a balance but we've got to work out how where is that line that you draw and say that's where you'd sit your national standards and say that's that's the aspiration we want everybody to aim to and we, we, we love people to go above and beyond that but this is quite a high aspiration that we're setting based on the good practice we're seeing in in the Telfords and the Barnets and Manchester's of this world where there's some good stuff going on um and then as I said before very quickly we want to start sharing that practice around so actually where we're seeing that good practice we're starting to push it out into the wider system beyond the change program local authorities and saying we want people to you know a lot of this you can do now without legislation like I said before the legislation we think of will be about legislation that gives us the levers to hold the system to account for delivering like this 
rather than you create a piece of legislation to say um, that might change parental rights, for example. I don't think we're in that space at the moment. We're in the space of we think the 2014 legislation is there or thereabouts, but we probably need a bit more enforcement back to, in, in behind it to make the system do the things that we want it to do. Um, and I think you know, the 2014 legislation is a classic example of you can write the best legislation in the world, it doesn't necessarily change anything. Um, and there are other levers we need to think about as well around accountability, as people have commented in the chat, around um, how you, you use the funding levers that we've got, because mm. whether we like it or not, money talks. Um, and actually, if you can attach your funding levers to some of this stuff, you start to drive uh, some of the behaviours that we want yeah. to see. And that's kind of the concern that we've started to bubble around is, you know, Telford have got a really good approach, but what their challenges are is where they're then finding that the funding isn't matching up to the drive for change or yeah. the um, want to create and commission in a space where they see gaps. Yeah. So it's just we're trying to unpick some of yeah. that locally at the moment. And we need to learn from that through the change programme, because ultimately, at the end of this, one of the things that Treasury have said to us is, you know, before you can make this a national system, you have to show us the evidence that it works and tell us they talk about unintended consequences what they mean is tell us what it's going to cost you know even if this is initial pump priming funding that you put in at the front end to hit that balance and then you can take it out again because the existing funding becomes more used more effectively um we are going to have to go back to them and say this is what we think it's going to take um and so that learning coming from telford and others about this is our aspiration this is where we think quality sits but to get there it's going to cost x y or z um, or it's going to need ABC in terms of teacher training or, you know, how we use TAs or, you know, all those other bits and pieces need to come together into a, a package of evidence that we can take back to the development of the policy, but also to, to Treasury and others to say, if we're going to make this work, it's, it's going to take this to do it. Thank you. What we can't afford, and I'll just add this in, is that 10.5 billion that I referenced earlier, that's doubled in the last five years. Something is not right. And you know, I know a couple of people have said in the chat about, you know, would, there are more complex needs being identified. Yes, there are. But when we do the analysis of the data, it's not enough to account for that massive hike in spend. So something is not working somewhere in the system. And that actually is to the detriment of those who do have those more complex needs because they're not getting the help in a timely way that they need it. Um, and it's a detriment to the rest of the system because money is all being sucked into one space um, and and at the end of the day the money for the school system includes all of that money we spend on SEN so the more we spend on SEN the less there is for the rest of the system and it just starts to go down into this negative spiral that the green paper talked about um, where nobody is actually benefiting from this at all and we need to we need to break that spiral and change it. Yeah, especially as, as well as local authorities more and more are heading towards bankruptcy or uh, huge deficits. Um, OK, so I'm just going to go to the chat very quickly. So uh, Nasheen's put in the chat. She's from Swindon. Uh, she said she thoroughly enjoyed the event in London. Can we try and get better comms for our parent carers? I've been telling them that for, for forever. Uh, Nasheen, uh, with easy reads and links to website to involve them in this and to help them understand what is happening. Uh, which then goes on to Jane's point around. So this is a regional project that is happening in local areas. How can we make sure that all the, the forums that are in those regions are part of the change programme? How can we ensure that that is happening as well? Which follows on from the comms side of things. Um, so, yeah, so we are doing a piece of work at the moment. I've got somebody working on the common stuff. Um, interestingly, our two primary audiences at this stage are um, our parents and schools, because we want to make sure the schools in those areas know that the department expects them to get involved and to help us do this stuff, um, because they're a key part of the system, as I've said. Um, and also, how do we get that communications to parents? And I'm, I'm hoping that Tina is going to help us with, with some of getting that right. Um, just to bounce it a little bit back your way, Tina, because um, because I'm we're not very good at writing stuff that works well for parents, so we can write the content. It won't be just me. It won't be yeah, just yeah, yeah. me. I know, I just, know, I know. just um, me. <laughs> and um, in terms of, I mean, the technical answer to how a PCF involved is both in the strategic guidance we've given to the collective CPP, so the three or four local authorities that have come together, we have said 
you need to put a steering group in place that oversees the program at a strategic level and that the regional NNPCF person needs to be on that steering group. And then at the, each of the individual local authorities, the guidance around their partnership and their plan says you need to involve your local PCF representative in this, as well as other parent groups, as well as making sure the children and young po uh, person's voice is, is heard in the mix as well. Um, so in that sense, we've gone as far as we can in the technical of these, these are the people that you must involve in helping do this. Um, and outside of the change programme, again, we get back to some point in the spring of next year as we start to push out what we're learning. We're going to be running regional road shows, doing webinars, all of that sort of stuff. Probably come back to an NPCF event. Um, I, I noticed today, I think somebody's been invited to go and speak at the Southwest one already, one of my teams, so um, later this year. So we're going to um, have that we're looking for that sort of regular drumbeat of communications but i think we will need uh, your help and others help to make sure that we land it well with with parents i love the i love the fact that as by magic jane appeared on the screen <laughs> she did although, so yeah do you want to come although, back to us jane although, although yeah, we have we do have becky in the chat it, it that's got a hand up as well so if you've got another question jane can we come no, back to it's, it it's, it's, just just to of, follow on. it's just part of that as as uh, whilst we recognise we've got 152 parent forums around and only very few are involved in the change programme. But just to go back, I suppose, on what Zara was saying a little bit as well, that each area does have something to bring and each area is where the living experience of what's working well and what could be better is happening. So I suppose you've answered it, Alistair, in that rather than it just being about PCF, this is about the living experience, like you were saying earlier, that the whole programme is about finding out what's out there that's working well and why this amount of money is not changing it, where the breakages are in the system. So I suppose that's something for us at NNPCF to be making sure that on, on those regional partnership boards, we, we can uh, bring the regional voice to that, really, as yeah. steering group members. So, yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you for that, but it would just to bring that back to, no, that's fine. to each area having something to bring and that um I suppose empowering us as yeah. a regional representative in Yorkshire yeah. number yeah. to sit there and say, Alistair yeah. said. Yeah, you may do that. You may do that. You can send them the video if you like. It's been yeah, recorded. But, um yeah. and, yeah, and I just... think I, I think just because I've just seen a, a few things in the chat on this as well. Um to be really clear, the change programme partnership steering group, so the thing that sits across the three or four local authorities involved, is a purely, at this point, is purely a construct for the change programme. It is not a long term bit of the system that we've designed here. I mean, we may learn from the change programme that grouping local authorities together and putting these, you know, sub regional sort of steering groups in place is a really good idea, but that's not the intention of the change programme. That is, that is very much a strategic level needs to be quite a small group. Some of the change program partnerships have got a committee going on and that's not really what we're after. We're after some key people that can just give that nudging and steering for the program. The real work happens at the local area level by the, yeah. the send an AP partnership and the local area inclusion plan. And that's where the real engagement with with parents in the day to day. How does this work on the ground? Um, that's where that happens. Um, yeah. the, the steering group is about just directing the program as a whole. And, yes. and if if it's not happening at that local area level, then you need to feed that into your regional rep. They will feed it back and say, oi, and we'll hold them to account. Um, and it is, you know, I think we forget it is a regional project that is happening at a local aerial level. And we need to make sure that it feeds in regionally in order to make sure that the programme is being successful. But you're yes. right. Alistair, the hard work, the hard graft is going to be happening in each local authority area that's that's got the yeah. programme. Yeah. And again, just to reassure some people in the chat, you know, is this absolutely what is understood across the areas? Well, not for one to put in bits of guidance and various messages out there ad nauseum to tell them this is what we want. That doesn't necessarily mean it's always interpreted or delivered in that way. And again, that's partly why we're working closely with Tina and others is so that we find out quite quickly by other routes if, if it's not quite working like that and we can do something about it. So my teams and the delivery partner teams, like I said, are, are physically meant to be present in those change programme partnerships at least once a week. Um, so we should be having those conversations. And if we find out 
that parents are not being involved, we will do something about it because part of the condition of their funding is that they follow the guidance that we've sent out. So, you know, it should be understood. I suspect that there will be some that say, oh, we didn't understand that. But we, we've we been quite black and white. We even sent them the list of regional NMPCF contacts. So they've got no excuses for saying that they didn't understand that we wanted PCF to be involved um, because we've made that very clear. But we will reinforce that if we need to, um, if we hear that's not happening. And we have been having those conversations. Yes. Um, Becky, I'm really sorry. To, thank you for your patience. Do you want to come in and ask your question? Yeah, to be honest, it's quite convenient that I'm asking my question now because it relates to what you've just been discussing. Fabulous. <laughs> I really value a regional rep and I know she's doing an amazing job on the steering group representing the region as a whole. However, I do feel that not having the parent carer forum leads who represent the, the play spaces involved in the partnership how can true co-production happen when, like in, in the situation, I'm from Brighton Hove, so we've got a ICB lead that sits on there. We've got three senior people from the local authority who sit on the steering group. Normally in everyday co-productive working, we work together at all levels, so really high strategic levels right down to operational. And I do feel that it is having an impact on the way that we would normally work in co-production. So I just wondered how it could be, how that could be avoided. And also, is it flexible with, with the regional groups? Can place-based parent care reform needs sit on the, the steering group if that is the way that, that co-production is normally done? Because I don't know how familiar you are with um, local area inspection reports, but in Brighton and Hove's one, co-production was highlighted as a really strong area. And I feel that the current setup is not, it's almost not being respectful of the strong and high level of co-production that we have in, in our play space. And also, I just wondered if some timeframes are going to be released of when all the different recommendations are going to be trialled, because parent care reforms, as you obviously know, um, a lot of us are parent carers, we all have strategic and participation work plans in place, and it's going to be very difficult with the capacity that is fluctuating because we're parent carers to suddenly have to replan a sort of priorities and things like that to fit in with, with this area of work if it's not clear when different things are going to be trialled. And also as well, I just wanted to ask about the role of Sendias as well in this programme and how they can become involved in the work as well, because obviously things that are linked to EHCPs are really going to it's really going to be beneficial and, and Cindy has need to be at the table for, for those as well. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, I, I, Tina, I don't know if you want to comment on some of this, because some of this is about how PCF operates. Um, and But I think it's in terms of that strategic steering group, it needs to be small. And so one of the challenges, taking it away from, from PCF Direct, is how do you get a representative of mainstream schools who can represent all the mainstream schools in four areas to sit on that steering group because you can't have the CEO from every single multi-academy trust of all of those local authorities sat on that steering group because it becomes a committee and it's not going to do anything. It should become a talking shop. So we're trying to keep that really tight and it's 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 not about how the provision is designed on the ground. That's not what that steering group's for. That steering group is about having oversight of the programme. Are all the local authorities in that area doing the things that we've asked them to do? So it's, it is it's, it is literally that a steering group and to provide a bit of challenge function as well as needed. The actual work in terms of co-producing, what does this look like for parents on the ground will happen in each of those local areas through the local partnership and through the local development of the local plan. So I think we've probably got the balance right as best we can. That does rely on there being really good communication between your regional an NPCF person and, and your local you, PCF forums. And do you want me to come in now? So yeah, I'll, yeah. So, be um, Becky, I, I knew you were bright and as soon, as soon as I saw your face, because we've had lots of conversations around your local area inspection. Um, uh, Sarah is fully aware of the difficulties around co-production in your region. It's something that she keeps raising. And, you know, at the South, the South East CPP are a little bit further ahead because their steering group is established and they have met. Um, and we 
as an organisation have had conversations, not just with Alistair, but also with the permanent secretary who Alistair's just talked about in his, his presentation around comms, not just for the change programme, but actually around safety valve and DBV, because actually they are all interlinked. You know, even with CPP, which, you know, is a once in a lifetime opportunity to test things out before we go to legislative changes within the system, send system, which is what everybody's been asking for. Um, the com, you know, communication is key for this programme. And you're absolutely right. There are some areas that do co-production better than others. And it is trying to learn from those areas. And you can imagine the areas who think that they do co-production well sometimes don't. And having that mis you know, disconnect between the, those areas is quite tricky. Um, I would say that Sarah has got your region absolutely spot on in regards to those people who do co-production well and those who don't and the difficulties around that so I would say is to have more conversations with Sarah I do agree with Alistair in that the steering group becomes unwieldy and then you can't steer it and the whole point of forums is that they are the ones that are testing it so if something isn't working well or something is working well or some areas are doing EHCP digitalization, as Zara pointed out in her conversation, it's about having those conversations with your regional rep and your local authority and your ICB in the CPP and actually bringing that to the table at the steering group. That's how that conversation shared. But at the end of the day, forums are doing the hard graft. The regional reps are not. They're just going so they're feeding this back they're feeding this back can we do this so that's how it works and i and i i can understand people thinking that they want to be part of a steering group because in local authority in sorry in local areas the steering groups are normally where it all happens and actually in this case it's not where it's all happening is actually at local level because that's got to be right there rather than being right at a steering group level because you're testing it and informing us back to the steering group and if it's not working then we need to challenge that back so i i get there is that sort of misdirection if you like but it goes again about comms we need the correct comms going out so that it informs people how many of the uh, how many local authority um, areas so how many PCFs have seen the guidance for this change program? I haven't. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so we we need we just need to share these comms better so people understand better uh, how this works. And actually, the PCFs are at the coal face of this. You are going to be testing it out, and if it's not working, then we, then the steering group needs to know about it. Yeah. Well, could it be that when papers are sent in advance of the steering groups that the parent care forum leads are on the distribution list? So although we don't attend the steering group meetings, we're still because Sarah, our regional rep and Brighton Hope Local Authority, they're both sending me the papers and things like that as they're sent good. out, which is really good. I, but, I, I would I would when my I'm not even there yet, Becky. We're not even yeah. met yet. Um so so I, I think that's a really good idea. And and I would do that in my region with my with my CPP. Yeah. yeah, and also it will save the regional rep a job as well, because then the onus isn't on them to send out papers because they'd automatically come out at the same time. Yeah, no, I think it's a really good idea. And, you know, and I want to thank the PCFs in advance for this work. It's going to be it's going to be hard graft. And so make sure you have that conversation with your CPP about funding for this work, um, because it's really important that you're funded for this work. And it is going to be a long haul. And it's so important that PCFs are part of this work. So I'm really pleased that PCFs are part of this, this work moving forward. Um, but, it, you know, we've just got to make sure that you're part of it, that you're also paid for your remuneration, whatever that is, and you have those conversations. But I think sharing the papers is a really good idea. And we can, you know, we can, um, I'm quite happy to say to CPPs, look, make sure you're sharing the papers. What I don't want to do is send them all out to everybody from here because that sort of starts to make me solving a problem that needs to be solved at a local level. Um, 
but do but do also bear in mind that the, that regional structure is, is is simply for the life of the change program it won't exist beyond the end of that it, it's a, a construct to help us drive the change program on your sendias point um I think that where they really start to come into their own and the what works in send and all of that stuff is as we start to go right now we're learning some things how do we get this out there how do we start to share this around how can we use the different bits of the system that are already doing improvement work that are already operating in this space to really help us um begin to share that practice and begin what we really want to do is sort of spring beyond and onwards from next year is begin to say can we get other areas outside the change program who won't have the money to do this but we're saying look this just works it's a more effective way of doing it it makes your money work harder to become early adopters of the changes that we're doing that don't require legislation to to enable them to happen um so they couldn't do for example an ehc plan template well they could if everybody locally agreed that was the one they wanted but we couldn't make them do it because it's it's not in line with the current code of practice um and it, to have a set foot performer is not in line with the current code of practice obviously the content is in is in line with the code of practice um or um we couldn't make everywhere do tailored lists because that would require a legislative change to to happen but things like we think everybody putting together is send an ap partnership that looks like this and producing a plan that looks like that is worth everybody doing because it's already driving real change on the ground in the areas where we're testing those are the sort of things we'd love to start to get other areas to take on board and i think sendias and others can come in and start to really help us be part of that sharing of practice thank you i'm just conscious of time we've got four minutes left thank you becky for your questions that was really good questions lisa your your hand is up and you'll be the last question come on in thank you actually um it wasn't so much a question but a comment um I'm uh, from the Barnet Parent Care Forum, so part of the London uh, group, um, and Barnet are the lead um, in our region. And um, just coming back on Becky's point, just a slightly different perspective. Um, uh, Barnet are um, well known for their um, for, for their levels of co-production, which I'm very grateful for. And actually, we've been involved, uh, the Barnet PCF, from right from the outset really including in relation to their expression of interest mm -hmm. and um, along with uh, Claire Richmond who is our local um, um, uh, PCF uh, rep I do sit on the steering group and we did at the last steering group meeting have a discussion about the size of it and it was noted that the group was quite large but actually um, Barnet local authority very much want us to sit on that steering group and do want us to be involved. So I guess, you know, there is some flexibility there depending on, mm -hmm. you know, your local authority. And I think that, you know, Becky, if you feel really strongly about it, it might be worth having another conversation. Because if, you know, I guess if the local authority feel they can make the steering group work in those numbers, there's no reason why that can't be accommodated. So, um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to give a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell somebody they can't do that. If you like, what we're saying is, as a minimum, this is what it needs to look like. If people want to go, if local areas want to go beyond that, that's in, that's entirely up to them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I hope it will continue to work. Um, you know, as I said, we've always worked really closely in co-production yeah. with them, and I feel that they feel very strongly that that we should be sitting on that steering group as well. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Um, to go to Zara's comment in the chat, yes, CPP funding, so uh, the um, Change Programme Partnership, should be paying for PCF involvement and engagement. And it is about having conversations with your uh, leads in regards to that. And they should be, um, sh they should be uh, remunerating you for your time. That's the whole point. Um, I think that's it for the time being. Uh, so we'll we will send you the chat as well. Um, so the uh, so you'll have a com. My phone is bleeping as well because of all the chat. Um, so so we'll send you the chat as well. So if there's any questions in there, because there were some yeah. really good comments, um, yeah. and we will need yeah. to make sure that that's feeding into this work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But thank you for your time, Alistair, and thank you for everybody that's joined us this morning. Hope you found it helpful. And please, if you've got any more questions, come back to us and we will feed it directly back to Alistair. So thank you very much.
That's my pleasure. Thank you, Tina. Um, and, you know, again, this is genuinely an attempt to work together to learn how to do the things that we said in the improvement plan, do what we need them to do, which is make the system better for everybody. Um, and, you know, the change programme is about learning the answers to those questions and many of the questions that you've asked uh, is, is, is genuinely trying to do that. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work with NMPCF um, as we uh, go on this journey together. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Take care. Thank you, everybody. See you. Bye bye.